Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ron Palanki, as you can see. Uh, I've actually joined Regenix Bio about maybe six months ago. Uh, these are my forward-looking statements. We are a publicly traded company, but mostly I'll be giving you a historical perspective today. Okay, so I thought I could use this opportunity to share with you the reasons I have joined Regenix Bio knowing the history and what inspired me to be part of this organization. The company itself has been started on four key elements, and that being people, science, capital, and plan. These are the essential elements that the founders had in their mind. And our founder, Ken Mills, speaks to these at every company meeting, and, and we try to retain these elements in a fashion where you're always trying to strike a balance and that equilibrium between these four elements as the organization evolves and becomes a leader in this space. Today I'm going to give you a perspective on how Regenix Bio started out, as a, started out as an aggregator of technology to becoming an enabler of technology to being a leader in the AAV gene therapy space today. So the story starts in 2007, after the discovery of the human genome in the early 2000s, where Ken, who's our founder and CEO, was inspired to really think about bringing the curative potential of that discovery to patients as quickly as possible. So he embarked on a train ride to Philadelphia to meet a pioneer in the gene therapy space, which, whose name you all should have heard by now, Jim Wilson, who's also a controversial figure in the space. Ken got off the train, met with Jim, and, and he realized that Jim has been on this quest since the early 2000s to discover, sequence, and design AAVs that were efficacious. If you really think about the AAV history, you know, it all started in the early 50s and 60s, which became a, a technology that could be used in the 80s and, and the first clinical trial happening around 1999. The problem with the previous technology with AAV gene therapy was it was safe, but it wasn't working. It's none of the trials that were being done and how the technology was being used was actually working in patients. And Jim embarked on this quest to really look for AAVs that would have efficacy. And that led to him discovering the fact that there were many more naturally occurring AAVs that could be efficacious. And that really translated into NAV technology. That meeting between our founder, Ken Mels, and Jim Wilson translated into this idea of a platform gene therapy company that became the NAV technology. NAV technology is focused on having a higher gene expression, longer-term gene expression, broad and novel tissue selectivity to tissues such as heart, retina, skeletal muscle, liver. At the same time, maintain the safety of earlier generation AAVs. So that idea really became the early guiding principle for the company. The idea at that point was to aggregate technology and make it available to people as quickly as possible so it could be developed to explore the curative potential of the technology. At that point, it was just an idea in 2007. No employees. Ken was a solo man that had this vision to explore something that was in the midst of a lot of controversy. The capital that we had was purely in kind. So, the idea now had to become an organization. And it couldn't be worse time than taking an idea and creating an organization around 2008 when we had the worst financial crisis. But there are a few things that happened during the time that helped Ken to really persevere and form this organization. In 2008, some of the initial work that was done with a earlier generation AAVs truly became a reality through the work of 
Al McGuire, Gene Bennett at the University of Pennsylvania, and today, which has come to be known as Lux Turner from Spark Therapeutics. That science was also translated into an editorial by Joan Miller in New England Journal of Medicine, provided the exciting science that was evolving even in the midst of such tumultuous financial times, our founders persevered to form Regenex Bio. And the reason I'm telling you this story today is it's our 10 year anniversary. So what happened after that? Ken set out to look for ways to validate the technology. So in 2010, as he traveled the world, he found a way to validate the technology at St. Jude's Hospital where they started using NAV technology for hemophilia B. As you fast forward, the company also took advantage of the environment that existed back then with, with the National Institutes of Health, with a lot of funding coming from the Obama administration, to start thinking about a grant for NAV technology-based X-linked retinitis pigmentosa uh, trials. At the same time, the organization was also very successful in licensing our technology to a large cap partner. And that brought in the early revenues into the organization. Or I should say capital, it's not revenue. Um, and something else happened. Around 2011, that early work that was started at St. Jude's became validation of our technology with about six patients that got published in New England Journal of Medicine showing the power of NAV technology in correcting hemophilia B. At the same time, the, the, the founders of the company also had a vision to think about how do we take gene therapy outside of monogenic diseases and translate that into a technology where we can use it to produce antibodies that can treat chronic diseases that require treatment forever, pretty much. And that led to the organization working with the National Eye Institute again and seeking a grant for the treatment of wet AMD using NAV technology where we could take the vectors, administer them in the back of the eye subretinally and produce antibodies that were already validated to treat wet AMD. And that was done in collaboration with Cornell and the University of Pennsylvania. So what the concept of vectorized antibodies? What we are doing with this program, which is OGX314, it's our lead program, and I'll show you some of the data from the program as I go through the presentation itself. So OGX314 is a AAV8 vector that has been encoded with a transgene to produce an anti of fab, which is essentially Lucentis. And Lucentis is a standard of care for wet macular degeneration. As all of this was happening, as you fast forward into 2014, there are other things happened in terms of validating the NAV technology. And also, some significant milestones in the history of the organization that have become truly transformative as we have become the leaders in the, in the, in the field today. In March 2014, the company actually licensed our technology for the treatment of SMA with our partner, Avaxis, which you all know today is on the verge of getting approved. At the same time, there is also a publication that came out with that work that was done in 2010 showing the long-term durability of gene therapy in hemophilia B. At that time, Regenex Bio had 10 employees. The science was getting more and more validated with less than a million dollars on the balance sheet. At that point, the organization decided to become a leader in the space. But you can't become a leader in, this, leader in, in the world of biotechnology with less than a million dollars on your balance sheet. So the organization decided to go and raise funds in 2015 with a $30 million Series C, $71 million Series D, ultimately going public, and the company had little over $250 million, and at that point decided to start growing the organization 
terms of people. This really goes back to our core, goes back to our core philosophy of how we look at growing an organization from that standpoint of people, science, and capital. And I'll talk to the last two years a little bit more in terms of how the technology has gotten validated and where Regenix Bio is today with its own programs. As you can see, that license that was given to Avaxis translated into a truly transformative curative therapy for spinal muscular atrophy, which got published in New England Journal of Medicine in November 2017. At the same time, there was also an approval for gene therapy in the US which is Laxterna, 10 years after the first patient was actually treated and nine years after the original publication that Al McGuire and Gene Bennett did. At the same time, the technology that we had licensed to Avaxis now was acquired by Novartis for almost $9 billion. During all the time, we were progressing our own programs internally at the organization, and I'm going to focus on 314 because that's our lead program that actually has data that's been presented in October 2018 at the American Academy of Ophthalmology. So these are our lead programs at the organization today. RGX 314 for wet AMD, we have an undisc undisclosed uh, indication that we will announce to the markets in the second half of the year. We have two programs today in the clinic in neurodegenerative diseases. There is one program that's being developed towards an IND submission. And we have a program in metabolic diseases for HOFH um, called RGX 501. And who are we today? Today we have 200 people at the organization with, this, with science that has been validated and, and on the verge of approval. And we ended last year with over $457 million uh, in cash. And today, our plan is to execute to our programs and get those therapies to the market as quickly as possible. With that, I'll shift to RGX 314, which is again our lead program that uses AV8 and has a transgene to encode for an anti-vegger fab, which is essentially Lucentis. The therapy itself is administered subretinally to the back of the eye. So the transduction happens to the retinal cells, which ultimately starts pro start producing the standard of care today, Lucentis. So what have we seen so far? What we've seen with our cohort three, which was the initial signs of our efficacy, we saw that there was therapeutic levels of protein production, both at one month and at six months. And now we are following the patients, and the recent data update we've, we have given um, up to nine months shows that almost 50% of patients in cohort three are going on to have increased vision gains and maintaining their anatomical outcomes in the back of the eye with no other therapy other than RGX 314 being administered to these patients. So what is the unmet need that we are trying to address with RGX 314? If you look at what has happened in the retinal space, the first transformative therapy that came to the market was in 2006, which is Lucentis. It has completely changed the way the disease is managed today. With Lucentis, there are great outcomes, but the problem is the burden of therapy. You can't stop treating these patients and you have to treat them for life. And data has shown over and over due to the burden of treatment, the trial and the dosing regimen is not followed that's been used in clinical trials. And what we are trying to do is do a one-time therapy and provide a therapeutic that's standard of care so these patients can move on and maintain their lives. With that, I'd like to uh, just show you one last slide where NAV technology has been adopted widely. As you can see, uh, there are programs that are using our technology with large caps for hemophilia A. Obviously, there's an imminent approval coming through with, with the public Purdue for date of May for SMA, for Zolgensma from Novartis. And there is another uh, other slew of uh, indications that are being pursued 
with large caps, mid caps, and small caps using our technology today. With that, I'd like to show you our team that's behind what we do at Regenix Bio, and thank you for our time.